well, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Erin. I'm one of the pastors here. I get the honor of sharing the word with you today. So I'm just going to... First, I, first, I want to tell you a very sweet story. So as I said before, my daughter just turned four, and man, like, she is good at celebrating her birthday. <laughs> she, I had to have more, let's just say, I had to have more than one talk with her about being thankful and not just, like, moving from one present to the next. Thank you. Moving from one thing to the next. Like, she was, she, she had it. So anyway, we had like a couple of our school friends over from uh, for yesterday, and we got this bounce house, and it was super cute. It was crazy. So we got this bounce house, and we got donuts because we had the party from 10 to 12 because I took a cue from my great friends who, who know how to schedule birthday parties. Do it in the morning before nap time. That way you run them down. Listen, you future parents out there, write this down. This is part of your notes today. Have it in the morning. <laughs> they can have sugar. They can run it all out, jump it all out in that bounce house. Then it's over with. So we had donuts. <laughs> we had a bunch left over, right? So I'm talking to my husband. I'm like, well, how many donuts did you have today? He's like, so far? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a thing. So far, I've had three. But before the end of the night, it will be a couple more. And I'm like, babe, you don't have to, you don't have to eat all the donuts today. He's like, no. Nope. I'm doing it for you so you won't be tempted <laughs> to eat the donuts. So I said, thank you, honey. Thank you for coming through for me. I, I so appreciate it. I got a great husband. So anyway, I'm going to jump right in today. I have, I, I got to tell you guys, I'm sorry, up top. Uh, there's a couple of scriptures that I didn't give you, uh, so don't worry about it. But um, I have, the Lord's just been putting a lot of stuff on my heart, and it's a wonderful thing. I've been in Hebrews, I've read Hebrews a bunch of times before, and it's kind of, it, like the first time you go through it, it can seem a little complicated. Um, but I've, I have literally been in Hebrews for like a month, and I can't get out of it. Like I, I, I even tried to read a different book of the Bible, and I wanted to go back to Hebrews. And what this book is about is it's a letter written by well, who we believe to be Paul um, to the Jews that were new believers, specifically Jews, right? Because after Jesus died and was crucified and came and was resurrected, lots of people started becoming believers. But this is specifically for the Jews that were um, being persecuted because the church came under great persecution after um, after Jesus died, and he was explaining to them the importance of not falling away. And I am going to start, and I'm going to start in verse, uh, I'm going to start in Hebrews chapter 5, and I'm going to go to verse 5. I'm building suspense. <laughs> Hold on. Let me just look in my notes because I, let me tell you, when I, I am all, not, not that I'm all over the place with, this, with this, this word, but man, I feel like God just kept downloading new stuff and more new stuff and more new stuff. So I want to start in Hebrews 5.12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled and in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And now I'm going to go into chapter 6. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washing and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment. It's telling us that there is a progression that needs to be happening. That's what it's saying. It's saying that there is some foundational stuff, but what he's saying to the group of people that he's talking to in this book 
is that you guys are stuck on this one thing and you keep regurgitating it and going back over it and chewing on it and, it, and you guys need to move on now. You guys need to move on. And it's like us today, there's things that we get stuck on or things that we can't get past and it causes us to stay in one place in our lives. And really, God wants us to always be growing. <sighs> I was telling God this morning when I was walking, like, he, he's so good because he doesn't want us to just remain in one place, but he also doesn't expect us to just go leaps and bounds. He wants us to, follow, put, to progress, right? Progression is getting a little bit better progressively in, what you, in ways that you can handle so that you don't just fall away. It was like, um, so I know Sean and, talk, Sean and I probably talk about this all the time, but we work out, we started CrossFit in 2014, and we kind of do something like CrossFit at home in our gyms. When I found CrossFit, I like, was really good at some things and not great at other things. But if I just pretended like those other things weren't there and didn't try to get better at them, like, okay, well, what do I have to do? I looked at the whole thing as an, in, in, its, in its entirety, and I'm like, well, what do I have to do to get better? Okay, well, great. I have to improve my endurance, which is... So, so hard. <laughs> I, it's not just all about lifting weights. I have to learn to do pull-ups. I have to learn to do, to do all kinds of crazy things that I never did before. That is the fullness of what CrossFit is. Now, if we are going to call ourselves Christians, it is not just about coming to church on Sundays. It is not just about reading your Bible a little bit here and there. It is about developing in the fullness of what God has for us. So there is a lot of stuff that we tend to neglect, and I want you guys to hear my heart because I, I agonized when he, <laughs> I agonized over this message today because I didn't know if I was ready to share it. But I want you guys to hear my heart and know that where I'm coming from, <laughs> it's going to be ironic, is a place of love. So I'm going to go from I'm going to go right into. John 13, 34 and 35. Sorry, guys, again, you don't have this one. I just want to read this to you. As Jesus is at the Last Supper, he's sitting with his disciples. He's chatting with them, and he's thinking about these things. This is right before he washes their feet. He says to them, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By all this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus had precious moments left with his guys. He had moments left. Everything that he's saying at this, during this time is calculated, right? It's measured, and this is what he says. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now we're going to get, I want to skip ahead and read just some more scripture. I'm, I'm not sorry that this is scripture heavy, but it is scripture heavy, just a warning. So y'all have to bear with me because you know I'm not that great at reading out loud still, unfortunately. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus... By a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Come on. 
this is a standard that we have to live by, right? This, this is the basics. This is the foundation, right? We've got to start with this. So this verse, this set of verses teaches us some really foundational things about our relationship with the Lord. Number one, it requires our action. The Bible says right there, what I just read, it says, let us draw near. I got to calm down because I told myself I wasn't going to be aggressive this time because I felt like last time I spoke, I was really aggressive. And that was like three months ago. So I'm just saying, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I got to calm down. It takes our action. God just doesn't come in and take everything away from us and let and make everything easy. We have got to go after him. We've got to seek him. It takes change on our part. It takes choices on my part in order to have a relationship with the Lord. We have to draw near. Go after him. We have to mean it. Number two, we got to mean it. With a true heart, right? It says with a true heart. We have to mean it. Our heart has to be pure. We have to truly want God. We can't want the blessing and not the blesser. We cannot do that. We must, 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 must truly know and understand the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross, the love that he had for us, for the joy in the future that he was looking forward to. He chose to die on the cross for me, and I'm not worth it. For you, and I'll let you finish that sentence. <laughs> That's who Jesus is. He died for us. We have to know that and understand that and realize that and really cherish that the truth of who God is, what he did when he sent Jesus to earth to die for us. Number three, we got to believe it. We got to believe it. You can say all day, God is faithful, but if you don't believe it, it doesn't matter. You've got to have a foundation of faith, knowing that God is who he says he is. But do you really believe it? Do you really believe it? Do you really believe that God is faithful? Because it's got to be real to you. It can't be real to your mom. It can't be real to your friend. It can't be real to the person that invited you to church, and that's enough. It's not enough. You've got to know. Deep down, you've got to know. I have a friend who, I have a friend who is believing to get pregnant and have a baby, and she was telling me a story about, you know, having this opportunity to, to, um, to do something. But it basically meant, like, giving up her dream that God was going to come through and, ha and, and help her and, and help her conceive. And she was like, so I said no, because I know that I know that I know that I know that God sees my heart and I know what his promises are. And she's not pregnant yet, but she is holding on to that because she believes that God is who he says he is. Can you say that? Can you look at the difficult situations in your life and can't you say, God is going to do it. God is going to do it. Without an answer in sight, God is going to do it. He's going to do it. It has to be real to you. You have to enter his presence with full confidence, full assurance. We have to be repentant. Our hearts have to be pure. There is a level of holiness that we have to be seeking after. Not being that bad is still bad. Being less bad is still bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's the truth. We have to be honest with ourselves because anything less is a lie. You're lying to yourself. 
Are you trying to live two lives? Because you won't be successful at either. And you will always be left wanting because you don't have the fullness of who God is. And that thing that keeps you from God is never going to satisfy you. It will never satisfy you. So whatever that thing is, you got to trust. you got to believe. you got to have enough faith that God is who he says he is so that you can get those things out of your life because it's not worth it. You know it. So you might as well just stop now and let God be who he's called you, be who he needs you, needs you to let him be to you. That was a mouthful, but I mean it. <laughs> We block, listen, when we choose to, I'm sorry, it's warm. I'm like regretting that I wore this over shirt. <laughs> uh, when we neglect, when we neglect sin, little sin, when we neglect that, there is a consequence. Even if it's like, um, you know, you think about, uh, I hate using traffic, but I am terrible. And the Lord has been so like, hey, this don't fit with who you are. This does not fit. Um, I was in, you know, it, if he, that sin, that moment of ridiculous frustration of, get, who, who is this? I know, maybe I'll say a name. I don't know. Sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. The consequence of that, guess what? The consequence of that, guess what that is? The Holy Spirit can't be around that, little as it is. So he removes himself just a little bit. Ah, and then I have to say, I'm so sorry. Why? Why can't I think, like, why is this person, oh, I hope that person's okay. They must be in a hurry. <laughs> why does my brain not go straight to that? But I, 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 I say that, I tell that because those little things, they really matter. We talk about traffic, and yeah, that, that's a small thing, but it's a thing. What are the other little things that are actually keeping you out of God's presence that are causing him to withdraw his spirit from you? It might not be some crazy blatant sin. It might not be fornication. It might not be doing drugs. It might be something small. And yet you're blocking the presence of God from your life. That is a consequence, and it is big, and we can't know it until we get it out, and then we experience what actually happens when we have a pure heart. Changing your mind, that's what repenting is. It is not saying, I'm sorry, and then turning around and going back, and then coming back and saying, I'm sorry, and turning back. That is a willful lifestyle of sin. And it cannot stay. It cannot stay. Why? We, this big famous guy who I, I, I love because um, he was an amazing writer, he committed suicide a couple of years ago. And I was like broken hearted about it. And I'm like, why? He, he had, years before, he had quit doing heroin. And I'm like, well, he might as well just have been doing heroin this whole time. Like, why, why would you allow a little thing to keep you out of the, the face of God? Why would you allow a little thing to keep you from fulfilling everything that God has for you? These little things that are flesh desires. I'm, I gotta, I'm, I'm not moving on from this because I'm not done. I'm sorry, I want you to really ask the Lord right now, and I'm even going to say, let's be quiet for a minute. Holy Spirit, move in this room. Speak to your people.
If there is anything that separates me from your heart, show me. Stay. God, I ask for power to overcome. I thank you for power to overcome. I thank you that inside each person that can hear me right now is capable of overcoming. Amen. Last thing, um, and I'm not closing, but last thing that from this verse, <laughs> don't get excited, y'all. <laughs> um, we have to fight for it. It says, hold fast to the confession of your hope without wavering, without being wishy-washy, without letting go. Hold fast. The Bible says things will be challenging. It will be hard. There will be times where it is difficult. You've got to fight for it. You must fight. You must. There is a whole section in Ephesians about the different weapons that we have. You are a follower of Jesus, which means you have access to the shield of faith to the helmet of salvation, to the shoes of peace, to the sword of the spirit. Come on. There's one or two more that I'm forgetting. Look it up. It's in Ephesians 6. But we got it. I said that first. We got it. We got it. We got everything that we need to fight. Why would we have armor and weapons if we were not supposed to fight for something? It takes wherewithal. It takes courage. It takes determination. And you know, it takes some self-discipline. He would not give us these things if we were not supposed to use them. Our weapons are not carnal. They are not carnal. We do not fight our battles the way that your unbelieving friends and family do. That's not how I fight my battle. We have to fight. And we got to be ready for it. Like, don't just, like, get knocked on your, off your feet every time something bad happens. And I, I come on. This is life. Things are going to be hard. You're going to be late. Things, you're going to miss the mark on things. People will fail you. And you got to be able to stand up and roll with the punches, man. You cannot afford to, to, to get knocked over by every difficult situation. You don't have to be. You don't have to. My, my friend, you know who you are. Every single time something bad happens, he's literally like, God, what are you trying to do in this situation? So I'm gonna tell, can I tell them your story with the tile? He shared about this the other day, but I was laughing about it all day yesterday because I knew this is what he was doing. He, so they just moved back in their house after being uh, with, their, with his parents for six weeks with their three children. It, it's a lot of people. So, <laughs> so God bless you, parents. God bless you, parents. <laughs> Um, so he finally gets to get back in his house on Friday and he's walking through his house on Saturday and he hears under the tile splish, splash, water under the tile. <laughs> and I know <laughs> that in that moment, he did not get angry. He did not think about that person that did the work in his house and get mad at him. He said, God, what is it about this tile that I need to hear from you right now? I mean, like, he is one of those. 
<laughs> no one I know it thinks that way. Who thinks that way? <laughs> I do not know. I want to think that way, right? Hey, but you know what? He didn't always think that way. He grew into it. He has a special anointing for that. And you know what? We can ask for it. We can pray for it. And God will bless us with it. But we have to develop that muscle. We have to switch. We have to take a right turn. If your brain goes one direction, we have to make it go a different direction. It's that whole, I talk about this a lot, but it's that whole neural pathways thing. Our brain is automatically going to go one way because that's the way we've trained it over time. If you're going to change the way that you think, you have to repeatedly change the way that you think. It doesn't just come naturally. We have to adjust and fix it. We have to make ourselves think differently. It's so important. <laughs> so important that we do not let off. Because change does not come easily. Change does not come easily. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Plenty of time, plenty of time. So that's foundational stuff. Now, we need this foundational stuff. We need to know how to fight, right? We got to have a pure heart before the Lord. We got to know him. We got to believe that he is who he says he is. In the very next verse, Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm going to read it to you in the NLT. Let us think of ways to motivate one another <laughs> to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Just as important as your relationship with the Lord is as your relationship with people I want you to think about that real hard because so many of us don't always do relationships well, myself included. But I'll tell you what, God showed me something and I'm not, I'm a person, I'm a regular person. I am fully regular like <laughs> Uh, it's funny because I, it's funny because like God put us together and he grew up in the church and I did not grow up in the church. I was, I came to this church trying to get my life right and find Jesus. And it's a beautiful pairing. Because I get what it's like, gosh, I get what it's like to change your life. But my relationships weren't always great. But this year... One of my biggest downfalls, I think, in general is just caring a lot about what people thought about me and letting that dictate how I was going to act, what I was going to say, the things I was going to do, the places I would go, the clothes I would wear, all the things, right? And this, and, and as, you know, you know that kind of goes away as you get older, right? You know, you don't care, you know, like... Your 30s, you're like, good, like, I do not care about you. <laughs> but it becomes different. It becomes different. You care about what people, people, you care about what people think about you in a totally different way. So this, when I came into this role, when I started working for the church last year, um, I know I've told you guys this before, so bear with me. He told me, don't worry about the people. I'm going to take care of the people. Right, so anytime that I was worried about controlling or fixing or changing or adjusting a situation because of people or individuals, then I had to stop thinking about that and focus on what the Lord wanted to do. And it was, it was a shift for me. It was a challenge for me. Um, and it, it continues to be a work in me, but it is also a great source of peace.
But when you're free from people, you think more about people in a different way. So one of the things that started that kind of came up for me is like I don't want to have any ill will toward anyone ever. So as I felt things checks in my heart, like I would make random phone calls. Like I just called a friend like two days ago and was like, hey, I need to talk to you. We haven't connected yet, but I'm going to call you. <laughs> but because I need to be open that if I have something in my heart against someone, I got to fix it. I got to let it out and I got to try to work it out. Our responsibility toward God is almost the same as it is for others. This is talking about that. We have got, we're responsible for our brothers. We're responsible for our brothers. I, I want to read this verse to you in Hebrews. It's also in Hebrews, go figure. I want to read this verse to you in Hebrews that just got me so good. It's 12, verse 12. My husband preached on this last week, and it was so powerful. It, it it was so powerful. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that, listen, those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Not for yourself but for other people. This is the will of God. And I'm not done. Work at living in peace with everyone. And work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Everything that I just read, it's not just about you. It's about the people around you, how you impact them, how you love them, how you help them when they're struggling. And it's not easy all the time to hear. It's not. But this is, this is the other half, right? We have this relationship to the Lord, and then we've got this relationship to the folks around us. This one is the most important, but this one is a close second. You can't have one and not have the other. Anyone says... Uh, who, anyone, I'm paraphrasing the scripture because I can't remember what it is. Anyone who hates his brother is not a child of God. I just, I'm, I'm going to reiterate, like this is a significant thing that God has talked, that, 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 that the writer is talking to us about. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest of the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. What are you stirring up in the people that are next to you, that are with you? What are you stirring up? What are you calling out? Are you calling them higher? Are you sitting in anger? Are you being a victim and blaming people? Are you? Because once you become a victim, you give somebody else your power and you can't do anything about your life. You become powerless. And it's hard 
we, Sean and I went to, we were talking to somebody about some decisions that we made when we first started the church. Uh, not started the church, obviously we didn't do that. Uh, when we first took on the senior, senior leadership role, we were talking to this outside party. And let's just call it what it is. It was a counselor. Because we go to counseling, because it's healthy. Just saying. Anyway, we, um, we were talking to this counselor, and we were telling him about some decisions that we made. And he's like, oh, yeah, that was a bad look. And I'm like, oh, oh. We had, we had not discussed some things with Bishop and Pastor Kathy that we were trying to implement, and it was hurtful to them. And we had to, you know, apologize for, for missing it. It was not intentional, but I missed it. And so I had to go to them and ask for forgiveness because we messed up. Ouch, that hurt though. I'm like, wait, don't you understand? What I'm trying to do is, is, don't you understand what I'm trying to do is make this better. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to fix this, whatever. That doesn't matter if I don't do it well. It doesn't matter. For years, I lived my life trying to make people obey the rules. You got to follow the rules. You got to follow the rules. I worked with disadvantaged, for, disadvantaged youth for years. And I look back and I'm like, God, I wish I would have been more loving because I wasn't. I just wasn't. I loved them, but I didn't show it because I was so worried about them following the rules. And it hurts my heart to this day because they didn't hear Jesus from me. They heard a merciless person from me. They heard someone that was not willing to accept their faults because my way was better. God has called us to have healthy relationships. And healthy relationships, they take work. Oh, they take work and they take selflessness. You have to be willing to say, I'm sorry. You have to be willing to look internally and say, I missed it, I messed up, I'm sorry. You've got to be willing because what happens, gosh, I hate getting older because I, gotta, I can't see anymore. It's the worst. <laughs> Watch out. Oh, wait, let me read. I'm sorry. I just love this so much. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall. We got to push a little harder for each other. We gotta push a little harder for the generations to come. We gotta push a little harder for the generation that's in front of us so that we can love them well and honor them. Just because they've been there before doesn't mean that they don't deserve the same care and concern. We think they're more mature or whatever. They don't take that stuff. But we still have a responsibility to make sure that our hearts are right before God. This is the other half of living. For Jesus, I'm gonna close. I just got a couple of notes here. There's, it says in the Bible, I mean, there's a proper, Matthew, just write this down for later. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. There's a proper way when somebody hurts you to deal with it. But it starts with a heart that is humble. It's not always, it's not always right but sometimes it is. We have to realize that in our relationships, we are not the only one who is experiencing something. 
They are having their own experience. And because their brain is not in our heads, we are not aware of it unless we try to make ourselves aware of it. This is the mark of maturity. This is what it was talking about back at the beginning in, in Hebrews 5. We've got to grow from just not sinning into caring for and loving others well. This is not just your church family, although that is a big part. And do not neglect that. Do not. Don't think that just because somebody's a Christian, they're going to act the, same, the right way all the time. There are times, there are a lot of times. I bet everybody in this room can think of somebody that, <laughs> or you know somebody that could think of someone that they probably should go to and apologize to or ask for forgiveness. Because living life is messy. And sometimes people get hurt. Here is the thing. I don't have to be right. He's right. And whether I have been wounded, it ain't mortal. No one can hurt me that bad that God cannot heal it. So why would I not give it over to him and humble myself? And you may say, you don't know what they did. I don't. But Jesus does. And he has strengthened and empowered you to fix it and make it right. He, that's what we're here for. We are here to love each other, to make believers out of everybody that we know. They will know we are disciples of Jesus by our love for each other. So if you are in disunity with someone, I got to challenge you. Pray about it. Fix it. Sometimes it can't be fixed, but you have to put yourself out there and be willing to apologize. I was talking to somebody a couple of months ago, and she was having a disagreement with somebody else, and I'm like, listen, I know that what she did is not cool, but you ha you've been angry at her and you need to go to her and ask for forgiveness. She's like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm like, I know what I'm saying. Sounds crazy. But that is how we keep ourselves completely free and open for the Lord to use because we have to protect ourselves from a root of bitterness. Nobody, no angry. If you're scrolling through Instagram and you think something negative about a friend that you see on there, that's, some, that's a check. You've got to fix it. Yes, you have to humble yourself even if they did wrong. You can do it. And you know what? I'll say I was wrong to be right with him. How much is that worth to you, to be right with him? Do you care so much about winning the argument or holding someone accountable, making them pay, give them, give you what they owe you? Can you let the Lord do a work in you? Can you set a new standard for your life so that the root of bitterness does not step in? It kills your body. It, does, it distorts your mind, the way that you think, your other relationships that should remain unaffected. It impacts everything. Bitterness kills. Bitterness kills. It sows discord. It is death to relationships. It is death to friendships. Jesus. This is true maturity. This is true growth in the Lord. Who doesn't want to do that? We got, 
I, this is not a Thanksgiving message, but it can be. <laughs> we got the holidays. Coming up, we see people. We all have those places that we don't really want to go because we got to see the person that last year they did, they burnt your biscuits, I don't know. Pie, that's more important, I don't know. <laughs> I want to challenge you. I know that this is not an easy message and I want you to know I, it was not easy coming out. Like, it's a hard message because we've all got to look in because there is no one that's above this message. This is a constant, like things don't grow if you don't tend to your garden, if you're not constantly pulling out weeds, if you're not constantly, you are never done growing in the Lord. He is making that very clear to me all the time, every day. I got room to grow. I got somewhere to be. I got somewhere to grow. But Thanksgiving is coming up. Christmas is coming up. And I bet there's somebody that you can say, I'm sorry I've had this thing against you. Or, hey, do you remember when that thing, it really hurt me? They might not respond the way that you hope. They might say, well, you shouldn't have. But here's what happens. When you make an attempt to right a wrong and you do it with a fully humble heart, the Lord comes in and can then heal you. It is not about the other person's response, though that is a good thing when you can find a brother in that reconciliation. He can then move in you in a greater level. Can I get an amen? <laughs> hey, let's pray before we go. Jesus, we love you. Oh, Jesus. God, I just love you so much. God, just take me deeper. God, show me more. Remove the veil from my eyes so that I can live more how you want me to live because that's my heart and that's my goal. I pray that over your people today. I pray that everybody feels a little bit more open and brave and courageous to confront the past and repair relationships, God. And I thank you for peace in places that those relationships cannot be repaired. I thank you for peace. I thank you for your healing. And God, I thank you so much for your blessing. I thank you that we get to eat on Thursday and it's going to be good. Father, I pray blessing over your people. God, we just love you. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for this time we've had. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all.